let's get started. Uh, I'm happy to see so many of you here. It's quite a technical talk, and I realize that you could go to another talk about 180 degree videos, another talk about 360 degree videos. So uh, I really appreciate it that you're here. I'll be talking about something that's quite technical. Uh, it's the new Jack and Jill build system. Uh, I'll even go very deep into it, showing you some bytecodes all the way down. Uh, don't worry about that. It's just to give you a feel of what's happening under the hood. Uh, because I'll also talk about the practical implications in our daily developers' lives. Uh, I'm Eric. Uh, I'm actually the developer of uh, ProGuard and DexGuard. Uh, you may have used those tools before. It's, uh, ProGuard is part of the Android SDK. It's a tool that takes applications, makes them smaller, more efficient, and a bit better hardened against reverse engineering. Uh, ProGuard is an open source project of mine. I started it uh, like 14 years ago, before Android even existed. And uh, it, it was a hobby project that grew out of hand a little bit. It became so much work that I uh, founded a company around it, and now I have even more work. Uh, so I'm the CTO at my own company, uh, where we developed DexGuard, which is the commercial extension of ProGuard that focuses on hardening apps against uh, reverse engineering and tampering. But I'll be talking about Jack and Jill today, uh, that's not my work, really. I'm not affiliated with Google, but I'm very interested in what they do from a tool developer's perspective and also just out of curiosity. So uh, let me tell you something about it. I'll start my talk by going deep into the internals of the, the build system, but then I'll, I'll then resurface and talk about the practical implications on all of our development. Uh, so Jack and Jill, they stand for... Uh, some convoluted acronyms. Uh, it doesn't matter really what, what they are, I guess. Uh, but what's important that it's about Java still. So some people were perhaps hoping that uh, Google would at some point switch to a different language. Well, not at this time yet. Uh, Jack and Jill are compilers, and they're uh, even default in the Android open source project build process. So if you're building all of Android, uh, Jack and Jill are already the standard. They're still optional in the Gradle build process. So currently, you're still using the standard DX compilers, typically. But you can all, already uh, enable Jack and Jill simply using the flag use Jack true in the current uh, versions of the Android Gradle plugin. And uh, in the more recent alpha versions of the plugin, the, the option has changed a little bit. Uh, where you can say Jack options enable true, and then you can evil, even uh, enable options to uh, use Java 8. Uh, this is uh, something that Romain Guy has talked about uh, yesterday already, and uh, I've added another option here that's not documented, so I'm letting you in on a small secret that I found in the source code. Uh, Jack in process true, apparently I needed to set that to get incremental builds in Jack, and I'll show that uh, later on also. Uh, if you uh, apply that flag, then you'll see in your build process that something is uh, slightly different. Jill is doing something to your libraries, and uh, Jack is compiling your source code. Uh, but in the end, it's all transparent. The output is still exactly the same. You get the same APK with the same compiled uh, Dalvik bytecode. Uh, now, why would Google then do something like this? Why would they switch to a new compiler? There might be many reasons for that. There might be technical reasons, and those are the most important ones that I'll focus on today. Uh, there might be some legal reasons, the, the licensing, for instance, of uh, the various components of the Android SDK. Google typically uses Apache. Other tools might have different licenses. Uh, and there might be strategical reasons in the tug of war between uh, Oracle and Google. Uh, I'll leave that to your imagination. It's uh, the era of uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, so let's get started. This is the typical uh, Android build process as you know it. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have uh, all the, the input that goes into an application, the, the code that you write. Uh, that goes through a flow. It's a slightly simplified representation here. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have everything that goes into the APK file. Uh, the most important part for this talk is 
the two-step process that you have going from Java source code uh, through the Java compiler to Java bytecode, and then through DX to Delphic bytecode. Uh, a small thing to notice here, I've chosen the color coding here. The blue blocks are uh, Oracle technology, and the green blocks are uh, Google technology. Uh, so uh, that's something that you might see evolving in the coming slides. It's an interesting observation I find myself. Uh, if you start inserting some more tools in your process, uh, Google has provided a transform API that allows you to plug in uh, other tools uh, to process bytecode, and this is Java bytecode. So then the process becomes a three-step or a multi-step uh, process, where in the middle, in between Java C and DX, you get some sort of uh, processor that you have inserted in your um, build chain. Uh, one of those tools is uh, ProGuard. And uh, I'll mention ProGuard wherever I can in my presentation, just to, because it's a tool that's very dear to me. Uh, and uh, ProGuard uh, takes Java bytecode and it uh, writes out Java bytecode. So it doesn't uh, even deal with Delphic bytecode. And uh, as you might know, ProGuard reads a configuration file that uh, you have to create to tell it something about uh, any reflection that might be happening in your application. And on the other hand, ProGuard writes out a mapping file that tells something about the name obfuscation that it has applied to the classes, fields, and methods in your application. So it has renamed all the original names to short, meaningless names. And that's what you can find in the mapping file. Uh, so at this point, it's a, a three-step process. Uh, let's see. Uh, all of that is quite convoluted at this point, especially if you start adding other uh, transform uh, tools. Uh, there is Java C, there is ProGuard, there is DX, and there are so, uh, so many intermediary files in between. Uh, so it always seems logical to try to make that more efficient by combining all of that together in a single compiler. And that's uh, what uh, the Android team has done. They have created Jack to combine all of these, uh, all of this functionality in a single uh, tool. Uh, and that then looks like this a little bit. At least that's what they uh, set off to do, but it, it didn't quite, uh, they didn't quite implement it that way uh, because Jack indeed takes your Java source code and it uh, compiles that straight away to Delphic bytecode. Uh, but Jack doesn't read uh, library classes, uh, so it doesn't read uh, Java bytecode. And that's a bit un unfortunate, perhaps, but uh, apparently it was by design. Uh, they've introduced another intermediary format uh, to deal with that, uh, the JS format, and I'll go into some detail about what that is uh, later on. And for uh, creating those JS files, they've uh, created the Jill compiler. So Jill. Uh, it's called a linker, but I consider it a compiler, really, because it uh, takes uh, library classes in bytecode, uh, uh, Java bytecode format, and it writes them, compiles them, transforms them to uh, JS files. Uh, so. uh, let's see. Delving a little bit deeper, but this is just to give you a feel of uh, what is happening inside uh, in, in the code. It's not really important for your uh, daily development. Uh, I'm, I'll show you what these tip, uh, different types of bytecode uh, look like, because by now you have three types of bytecode. You have Java bytecode, JS bytecode, and Delphic bytecode. Uh, suppose that you have a simple for loop in Java, uh, like shown at the top. If that's compiled to Java bytecode with the Java C compiler, it looks like the, the instructions that you see there. The precise uh, meaning of that isn't very important, but you have uh, variables that you can write to, and uh, the Java bytecode, uh, the virtual machine, is based on a stack. So it pushes some values on the stack, pops them again, uh, performs comparisons, uh, conditional jumps, unconditional jumps, and so on. Uh, that Java bytecode is transformed to Delphic bytecode in the, in the traditional build process. And 
Uh, Delphic bytecode looks fairly similar. Uh, the main distinction there is that there is no stack. So everything is uh, translated uh, or operated on straight in uh, registers or re local variables. And uh, the code looks like that. So you see variable zero, variable one, uh, operations on it, uh, jumps, and so on. Uh, and as you can see in, in the slide, I guess, a little bit already, uh, this Delphic bytecode was partially created for the reason of being more compact. It's slightly more compact than uh, Java bytecode. And these uh, bytecode formats, they're very efficient to uh, operate on, uh, to, to execute, at least, on a virtual machine. Uh, but the translation process, and they're very similar also, but uh, they're dissimilar enough to make the translation process quite computationally intensive. So if you're compiling your code, the DX compiler is taking quite a lot of time because even though the languages or the, the representations are very similar, they're not so similar that it's just uh, all straightforward uh, instruction by instruction. Uh, so they're efficient to execute, but not that efficient to uh, operate on, to perform computations on. So uh, in the Jack and Jill compiler, they've introduced the JS format, and that's an intermediary representation between class files and Dalvik uh, bytecode. And for this example, it looks a bit like this. And surprisingly enough, this uh, bytecode is a, a higher level representation than the other types of bytecode. It's more like a, a binary representation of the abstract syntax tree that you have uh, in, your, uh, in your code. So uh, it's more like a literal translation of the Java source code uh, that, uh, that you have at the top. Uh, but as an intermediary representation, it's uh, easier to operate on and perhaps also to uh, optimize uh, with the Jack compiler going through the, the oh. Delphic bytecode. Uh, now, let's see what kind of implications that has uh, for our development. Uh, you've seen the, the flow in, in the build process and uh, what's possible in the Jack compiler is uh, to introduce annotation processor. That's uh, a small plugins that you can have in your compiler, in your Java compiler typically, uh, where code is generated based on annotations that you have in your code. Uh, that is still supported in JAG because they added support for these types of plugins. On the other hand, if you have uh, tools that operate on Java bytecode, uh, you have to go through Jill because JAG doesn't understand Java bytecode at all and uh, you have to go through a, a more convoluted process. Uh, similarly, if you're using uh, other uh, languages like Scala perhaps or Groovy, uh, these are typically currently compiled to Java bytecode and you also have to go through Jack, uh, uh, through Jill to get uh, through Jack and then to get your final Dalvik bytecode. Uh, there are some other small features or important features perhaps that aren't supported at this point but that will no doubt be supported uh, eventually uh, like instant run. Uh, showing that in a diagram the same thing. Uh, suppose that you have Scala source code, you compile that to Java bytecode, that has to go through Jill and that has to go through Jack to get your final bytecode. Uh, in the meanwhile you can also operate on the Java bytecode in your with bytecode processors uh, but you can plug in your uh, annotation processors uh, straight into Jack. Uh, so it's, it's getting quite involved again, uh, unfortunately. If you are using a different language in uh, Java, it, there's not much of a, an advantage here, in, in my opinion. Uh, perhaps if these language uh, developers have some spare time, couple of weeks, months, years perhaps, uh, they can look into uh, the internals of Jack and Jill. Uh, for instance, the Jack compiler is internally based on the Eclipse compiler, not the Eclipse IDE, uh -huh. but the compiler. Uh, so you could switch that out for something else uh, and uh, compile Scala perhaps. Uh, and if, you're looking, if you look into Jill, it's internally based on the ASF4 library to read uh, Java bytecode. 
uh, as a tool developer, you could look into that and uh, plug straight into Jill if you modify that code. Uh, it might be a bit early to start doing that because it's still evolving, uh, but technically that might be a possibility. Now, as a developer, you probably care more about uh, what you can do with it, what are the advantages, uh, because the process is transparent, uh, you get the same bytecode out as you put in, and of course, the, the most obvious advantage here is that you can use closures. And I've shown an example here where you can add an on-click listener uh, with just a small piece of code uh, instead of having to use an anonymous uh, inner class. Uh, now, Jack has an option, or by default, compiles that uh, to uh, an inner, uh, uh, a separate class. It's not exactly an, an anonymous inner class, because uh, if I remember correctly, it doesn't have that uh, this parameter uh, that is implicit in anonymous inner classes, so it might have uh, fewer problems with memory leaks that uh, a presentation has mentioned earlier. Uh, so it's a, it's a separate class, and in, in that sense, the, the implementation of closures is uh, just a syntactic shooter. And the advantage of that, is, of course, is that uh, it works for all versions of Android, not just Android N. Uh, on the other hand, there are uh, more changes coming up, and uh, it's not just uh, Jack and Jill, the compilers, but there is more happening around it uh, and related to it. So Jack and Jill compile to Dalvik bytecode, just like uh, it used to be. Uh, but there is uh, also something happening uh, on the device. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a move to the OpenJDK, and that all makes sense now that you know that there is also support for closures, because uh, closures become mostly interesting if you can also use the support that's in the uh, Android runtime library. And uh, so this is a, an important move that makes uh, a lot of sense uh, seen in combination. Uh, so the, the effect will be that you'll compile against uh, the, the stops uh, of the OpenJDK, uh, plus the Android extensions, of course. And on the device, on new Android and devices, you'll have uh, the implementation of the OpenJDK plus the Android extensions. Uh, okay, so uh, this is important also because it uh, releases uh, some of the burden on, on Google to maintain the original Apache Harmony uh, implementation that they have. Uh, and it, uh, it's funny in, to see that there is uh, yet another blue block uh, in being introduced in, uh, in the entire ecosystem here. So perhaps there is... Uh, world peace coming after all. Uh, in addition, uh, there is a new functionality with uh, default methods that are being supported. Uh, in order to have those, even though it's uh, just a fairly simple change internally in bytecode, there's not that much difference, uh, but in order to have the uh, virtual machine support that, uh, you need some changes, of course, and so that's why the, these changes uh, the, the default methods will only be available in uh, Android M. Uh, and as I mentioned, that's uh, very nice for your own development, but it's also important for uh, getting the support that you have in uh, the runtime library to get for, uh, the ex extended methods in the list uh, class, for instance, or the list interface. Uh, in addition to that, at a very low level also, uh, Android N introduces some new instructions in Dalvik bytecode. Uh, while they're at it, why not go the whole way? And uh, we're adding uh, new classes, uh, new implementations in the Android runtime anyway. So why not change the, the Android virtual machine as well, or uh, the, the art uh, environment? Uh, and uh, this is uh, just internal. It's not actually being used yet, so you, you won't see it in your compiled bytecode. But if you look in the source code, you'll see that there, is, uh, some, uh, there are some new Android instructions, some new Delphic instructions to su support Lambdas. And this is all moving in the, the same direction as uh, Oracle again. So Oracle changed their compiler, Oracle changed the uh, Java virtual machine, Oracle introduced new instructions, new constants, and so on in uh, its Java format. 
and Android is moving in a similar direction. The implementation is different, but it's uh, similar. Uh, now, more practical again. Uh, so, what can you expect uh, if you're using Jack and Jill in terms of build performance? That's important for every one of you, I guess. Uh, at the top, well, these are a lot of bars, but at the top you see uh, some measurements I've performed with the traditional tool chain, uh, starting with a full compile of the Google I.O. app as a test here, and then with incremental compilation, depending on how much you change in the code, uh, the compilation times decrease uh, for smaller and smaller changes. I've also compared that with uh, uh, introducing ProGuard in the tool chain, and then doing a clean build with ProGuard, uh, maybe surprisingly, uh, reduces the build time. And that's a bit counterintuitive because you're adding more steps in that build chain. But the reason for that is that ProGuard, very early on in the build process, can reduce the size of the code significantly. And then it becomes faster in the rest of the build process to do all the transformations and compilations. So a completely clean build is faster with ProGuard than without ProGuard. If you also uh, enable optimizations, uh, then the build time increases a lot. Uh, optimization takes time. And that's uh, true in ProGuard as well. Uh, I've also compared that to DexGuard uh, with similar results, uh, although DexGuard is, uh, has more optimizations and it's uh, even slower than ProGuard if you enable it. Uh, and then I've compared that to uh, Jack and Jill. And if you do a clean build, uh, actually the build times increase. So it takes a longer time because a lot of files have to be uh, created. They are cached. Uh, for instance, uh, converting all of your uh, libraries, converting the runtime library even, or the stubs, uh, all in the JS format and uh, in pre-dex formats. If you then do the incremental builds, the times decrease again depending on the, the size of the changes in your code. Uh, overall, uh, the, the build times aren't shorter this way, but this is something they are no doubt working on, and uh, you have to take these numbers with a grain of salt. It will pr uh, probably improve over time uh, even more. Uh, I guess most of the improvements that I've seen in, in build times are not due to the compilers, really, but due to the uh, very aggressive amount of uh, caching that's being done. So in the case of Jack and Dil Jill, the JS files are being cached, the, the DEX files are being cached, and all of that uh, improves the build performance. So um, a lot is happening there in the Gradle plugin as well, so there's a, a lot of improvement going on there. Uh, that's build times, but what if you look at the application that you get out of it? Uh, is it faster? Is it, is it smaller? Uh, I've done a small test with my favorite uh, caffeine mark benchmark. It's a computationally intensive benchmark. It doesn't look at I.O. time uh, performance. It doesn't look at graphical performance. It's purely computation in bytecode. And uh, with the Java compiler, you get a certain score. The Jack compiler gives you a slightly better score. Uh, but ProGuard still gives uh, a better score. And, I'm very happy to present uh, such a number, of course. Uh, and the reason for that is that Jack, at this point, doesn't really do much optimization. So there's, uh, it's a brand new implementation, and there's uh, certainly a lot of space uh, to improve on that. But ProGuard has a long tradition. Uh, it has been uh, developed for a long, long time now. And it performs more optimizations like method inlining or uh, removing unused parameters. Uh, propagating constants in the code, and so on. And on a, a fairly relatively primitive uh, virtual machine like uh, Dalvik or even Art, uh, that still makes a considerable, uh, considerable difference. So uh, this was uh, measured on Art, which does ahead-of-time compilation and also optimization. But in spite of that, uh, uh, optimizations in your bytecode can still make a difference. And that's surprising, maybe. So the the, the optimizations that you do in bytecode appear to be complementary to what you can do uh, on the device itself. Perhaps that no, that's no surprise because your uh, desktop computer is still a lot of more powerful than a device and uh, you can spend a few uh, minutes to get uh, an optimized program. 
Uh, then I've also tested with DexGuard, which has even more optimizations and that provides a better result still. Uh, I've also looked at application size. Uh, so what happens if you get, uh, if you just use the standard tool chain without any minification or shrinking, uh, then you get an app of uh, 3.1 megabytes. If you enable minifications with Jack, you get a reduction by 40%. That's similar to what you get with ProGuard and uh, DexGuard can do a bit better there still. Uh, so essentially the, the shrinking that's going on inside Jack is uh, the same as, as what happens inside uh, ProGuard. Uh, just uh, to, to show you, uh, I'll, and to, uh, to show the difference between what uh, the other compilers and what DexGuard is doing, I'll, I'll show you the, the little secret of DexGuard. DexGuard processes uh, not only the bytecode, but it also processes all your assets and resources and uh, native libraries, and it uh, performs optimizations globally. So uh, it also has a 360 degree view, so you get uh, some 360 degree view here as well. Uh, and that's why it, uh, it can get better results. And in my opinion, this is where the tool chain will be moving eventually also because you can get better results if you look at everything at the same time and if you can do optimizations across uh, assets and resources and code and so on. So, uh, conclusions uh, in my talk. If you look at Jack and Jill internally uh, and the, the larger uh, environment of Android, there are huge changes. There are changes in the compiler system, in the uh, representation of your code, in uh, the, the runtime on the, the devices, in the uh, virtual machine on the devices. Uh, but it's a clean implementation and this opens up a lot of opportunities for future improvements. If you're interested in languages and tools, uh, there is a shift, of course, and uh, in that respect, uh, Android is a bit of a moving target. It's evolving very rapidly, and if you're writing a tool, you have to keep an eye on it. And everything I say here might be different tomorrow again. So uh, check all the blogs and uh, public announcements of the Android team. Uh, so that might an have an effect, of course, on your own development if you're using any of those tools. Uh, but most importantly, I guess, for your own development, uh, you'll get more efficient builds, if not now, right away, eventually, for, uh, for sure. And uh, you'll have Java 8, which most people uh, are looking forward to. Uh, if you want to learn more, there are uh, several references here. Uh, an interesting one is the, the one that uh, Chet has uh, mentioned yesterday. It's a, a podcast with the, the Android engineers. Uh, and it also goes into some detail about uh, the new ahead of time and just in time compilation that's uh, in there. Uh, that's quite interesting for uh, technology geeks like myself. Uh, so that concludes my part of the talk. Uh, thank you. I think we have time for some questions. I didn't quite get that, uh, so uh, we can take that offline, sure. Yes, go ahead and speak up. To be honest, uh, I don't know. So why Instant Run doesn't work with Jack and Jill, uh, I haven't looked into that. It's uh, probably mostly a, a matter of uh, integrating everything in uh, Gradle and in Android Studio, so uh, I'm sure there are no fundamental uh, problems there.
Anyone else? Okay. Um, uh, you said that uh, whenever Red Hat Lambda, like whenever we use Red Hat Lambda, uh, jail will be in. So it, it should, it, yeah, because we need that intermediary step. Yeah, so with Retro Lambda, it works on Java bytecode and produces Java bytecode. So the only tool that understands Java bytecode is uh, Jill, and you need to go through Jill uh, to get that. But of course, with uh, Jack and Jill, you don't need Retro Lambda anymore because the functionality of Java 8 is present in. Uh, well, we still need full coverage, for instance, and other, okay. other tools which operate on the bytecode. Yeah, level. yeah, indeed, yeah. And. Uh, well, that's uh, mostly theoretical because there is no official support for such a, a chain yet. Uh, but that's how I see it. It would be necessary. So there is a transform API in the current uh, Gradle tools, but that transform API isn't supported with Jack and Jill yet. Yeah, the intermediary representation, JSON. what the use of that is. Uh, I guess it decouples Java bytecode from Jack. Uh, and it, uh, so Jack doesn't need to be concerned with uh, the Delphic bytecode anymore. Uh, and because you have those JSON files, you can cache them and they're probably more efficient to operate on. Uh, so that might be the advantage. But class is not Delphic bytecode. Java bytecode. So at that point, yes. like when uh, GL kicks in, we, we don't we don't have uh, uh, Dalvik bytecode yet. We, we didn't go to the yet. No, no, no. That's only at the very end. Uh, another purpose of JS eventually might be that it could be a, a way to distribute libraries. So now we're distributing uh, class files. But eventually, it, it might be possible to distribute uh, Android uh, code in the form of the JS format. Uh, that could be an alternative purpose of uh, having that. So it's it's more uh, tuned for uh, Dalvik uh, processing, uh, and in, in that way, it, it could be interesting. Um, that's a strategic decision that Google might make at some point. One more question. Sure. So um, you mentioned for the other JVM languages and for the bytecode uh, emulator that you need Jill. Does that mean that, like, is there any implication? Like, oh, I guess my assumption is that Jack and Jill are supposed to be used together. So is there a disadvantage to like using Jill, or is it just is that just an implementation detail that you're explaining? Uh, it's unavoidable. It seems in the current technology that that's out there. So. If you want to use Jack, Jack doesn't read bytecode, so you need some adapter to uh, solve that, and Jill is this adapter. Okay, and so they, they are designed for each other, but there's no like, negative implication for the fact that you need Jill to do like, a double chain implementation, for example? I don't think so, no. Uh, okay. It's just that you have uh, these additional steps that you didn't really have beforehand. So uh, using different languages is uh, a bit that bit worse and off than it was before. Okay. Thank you. Well, I mean, if you, if you don't have external libraries, you don't need Jill, right? If you, if you compile everything from, from the Java source code, you just need Jack. If you just compile from Java source code, if you only have source code, then you can, uh, you only need Jack, that's true. Uh, but that's very uncommon, I, I guess. Uh, yeah. Okay, then, uh, time for lunch and a nap. Thank you. Yeah.